Hey all, welcome back to our uh, book club in geocomputation with R. We're going to look at chapter 12, statistical learning, and if time permits, we'll also look at chapter 15 about ecology. As we ended up talking about last time, uh, someone pointed out to me that the words statistical learning and machine learning have slight differences, and I thought I'd address that at, at the start. As someone who teaches statistical classes, um, this makes sense to me that we usually think about statistics as modeling, focusing on the sample, the, the population, the hypothesis, et cetera. Whereas machine learning is an algorithm that could learn from data without relying so much on rules-based programming. And a lot of our work with machine learning is driven by making predictions through supervised learning, unsupervised learning, or perhaps some other methods. I'm quoting from some dude on Kaggle. And nowadays, there's a whole grand task view for machine learning and statistical learning for those who are interested. We'll look at some of the packages today. Admittedly, I'm going to talk uh, pretty fast. I'm assuming that the audience has seen some machine learning, but for a little bit of a view, we're going to look at uh, supervised and unsupervised techniques. Supervised is where there is training data. Unsupervised techniques um, where there isn't labels in advance and the popular algorithm is clustering. We call that response variables can be binary, categorical, integer, or otherwise numeric. And in general, uh, predictive performance is aided by cross-validation to deal with the bias variance trade-off uh, so that your models are extendable to larger data or additional data sets. That is cross-validation helps to detect overfitting. The issue is that with the data sets we're considering, we're going to encounter spatial autocorrelation where the training and test sets would not be independent from each other. In other words, if you have spatial data points, uh, two dots that are close to each other are probably related to each other somehow. So we're going to think about what it means to do spatial cross-validation. <clears throat> uh, as usual, we got a bunch of code packages to consider. Oh, uh, before I forget, there was a code package that was mentioned in the textbook called MOR3 Extra Learners. I did not get that one to work in the updated R4.3, but this package is literally extra and it only comes once, comes up once today. All right, uh, here in chapter 12, we're gonna look at this case study about landslide susceptibility. And the picture didn't come up. Let's see if I could reload this. There it is. So we're going to look at Ecuador, and we're going to look at a certain mountain slope in southern Ecuador and talking about the possibility of having landslides at certain places. This map was made by a person who goes by Research Morena Morora on Twitter, and this is using the popular ray shader technology. Let's see, uh, we're gonna practice with the data set supplied in the SP data large package. We're loading these files. LSL, the, the landslide locations, is this data frame here, XY locations. Um, whether or not the locations are susceptible or likely to have landslides, the slope, the Let's see, did I have the descriptions down here? The plan curvature, the profile curvature, so slope and degrees, plan curvature and inverse meters as, as well as this curvature. Elevation in mean above sea level, 
and we're going to look at the catchment area for water flowing towards the location. Now, uh, water flows are non-negative numbers. And in some areas, namely if you're really in a watershed or really right next to a river, these numbers could be relatively large compared to other locations. So you'll notice that the analyst did a log transformation on that. Study mask is a polygon shape file. TA, um, I admit I probably should have revised the variable names compared to the textbook. TA is a sp spatial raster. They called it TA because along the way they used the terror package. Or they called it TA there as well. And that again is a spatial raster with some of the prop attributes that we've studied in the past, including the extent and these values here. So visually, what we're looking at is this study area. Some areas marked in red are susceptible to landslides. Some areas marked in blue are not so much, M maybe used for real estate development or otherwise tracking the safety of being in that area. <clears throat> All right, for supervised learning, uh, again, I'm going to talk fairly quickly, but if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. We're going to be uh, using a generalized linear model, landscape, uh, landslide susceptibility points for the response variable the others for the predictive variables. Because the response variables were true and false with those two labels, we put binomial here for the underlying family that makes this a logistic regression situation. Looking at the summary of the GLM fit, we see that at the moment, it seems like the mountainside slopes and the curvature are the significant variables along with the water flow, which sounds like it makes sense when you're talking about landslides. Nice thing about our programming language, once you have something done with that, with the model, you shove it into the predict function. We have a response type with the logistic regression. And what we get with the predictions are numbers between zero and one. We call how logistic regression tends to go with the S-shaped curve. <clears throat> Here we could plot the prediction raster. The greenish colors are where we're susceptible to landslides. The brownish colors are elsewhere on the mountainside. So this also probably fits our intuition that landslides tend to happen in places with more slope, more curvature, and more water. When we do a classification machine learning or statistical learning task, machine learning task, a popular metric is area under ROC, receiver operator characteristic curve. We call that with ROC curves, the values are between 0.5 and 1.0. 0. 0.5 is basically pure randomness of flipping a coin, and you want numbers close to 1.0. We could compute the um, AUC using the PROC package, and we get an AUC um, of about 0. 0.82. So Seems like it's doing a pretty good job for arguably very few lines of code. 
Okay, so what then happens in machine learning is that we would need to consider cross-validation to once again, worry about the bias various trade-off and how generalizable the model can be. You don't want it to be um, specifically made for only the, uh, only the training set. So in cross-validation, the idea is to split um, multiple times the data set into separate training and testing sets. And then you would do this process, say the logistic regression with these different partitions of the sets and use a metric such as AUROC -A and eventually pick arguably the best model from that point of view. Looking at the top of the graphic at the moment, if it might be difficult to see on your computer screen, the idea is that the training and testing sets are labeled in red and blue dots. But if we pick those and assign those at random, the issue is that because we're talking about uh, maps, because we're talking about spatial data, those dots might not be as independent from each other as the underlying mathematics asked for. So with uh, spatial cross-validation, the bottom row of this data, the idea is to partition the training and testing sets in a way that we still have these clusters. In fact, um, part of the algorithm is to use k-means clustering along the way. The, the splits still happen, but as you can see, in a much more organized way as far as the spatial coordinates are concerned. And yes, thank you for the logistic um, regression. Didn't see that comment before. Uh, we have a response variable there to uh, get the odds. Yes, uh, the odds ratio. So, and I mentioned that. So with those ideas in mind, um, in recent years in the R programming language, there have been better packages to deal with machine learning. And I'll admit, um, reading over this chapter, this is my first foray into MLR3. There are other packages in the R universe that helps with machine learning, such as Carrot back in the day, maybe Tidy Models is the arguably the most popular choice these days. And these are compete with the even more popular systems that we might see over in the Python programming language. However, it looks like the textbook authors are going with MOR3 because of the spatial cross-validation concerns. Nevertheless, with a system like this, this helps us organize our thoughts where we deal with the training set, test set, partition, where we have models that learn with the data, where we um, make predictions, measure the performance, and perform cross-validation. Uh, folks in the chat are also pointing out that these days, tidy models might also have the spatial cross-validation as well. So now looking at generalized linear models in this framework, in MOR3 in, in particular, along the way, we're going to use the spatial temp temporal cross-validation package. We're going to label this task, kind of like designing a whole workflow. We're going to label this Ecuador lands, landslide susceptibility. There was a bit more here. Basically, the textbook authors told us to be careful to make sure that you clearly have defined your response to predictive variables, as with anywhere else in modeling. We have the landslide point locations 
to find um, what's our success variable in the binomial setting. And as we've seen in spatial data types, query state what your coordinate names are, query state your projection. And in your modeling, you could use the coordinates, the latitude, longitude as part of your predictor variables if you want to. We're just not going to do so right now. This MLR3 um, group of packages has a visualization package that helps out as well. We could take that task, uh, look at the side-by-side -side comparisons between the true and false values. Now, when I was uploading this uh, set of notes to our book, for some reason, this part here failed and it wouldn't go through the GitHub checks. Fortunately, our host um, added the GG Ally package or GGALI package, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. And that seemed to help make things work here. This picture, admittedly, I, I left as, as probably too far zoomed in to say if there are any differences or to highlight any differences. One thing I really like is this next graph here where you could produce a pairs plot. A lot of good distributions, some um, densities, scatter plots, correlations, maybe even some sensitivity and specificity. Now on my computer, this plot took a relatively long time, maybe about five whole seconds, but of course that's much longer than most of our calculations so far. Just maybe keep that in mind if this enters to, into your workflow in with larger data sets. I should have thought in advance. Um, what I'm looking at now is seeing if there's any obvious difference between the the true and the false, the purple and the green regions. It's not that apparent at the moment. So perhaps like um, people in the chat are saying some differences between the true false populations for slope and C plan. In previous chapters, we did uh, do surveys or overviews of the various packages out there. So it would be remiss if we did not do so here. There are various ways to bring in different learning algorithms into this MOR3 um, space. Oddly enough, the information uh, about them is stored in MOR3 extra learners. That's the package that I did not know today. But then the textbook says, well, if you bring in one of those learners straight from the MOR3 package, you could then get the manual by literally using the help command as usual. <clears throat> and they do have very good documentation here. Oh, I should also point out, um, depending on which one of these algorithms you try out, like elsewhere in the R universe, uh, these might have coming from different 
our packages binomials from the one of the original packages, the stats package. We have some being a little more exclusive to MOR. Some of the processes I will see just in a few minutes will be coming from current lab. So then part of the workflow is how do we carry out the spatial cross validation? That is, um, how do we uh, carry out something like the bottom row in this graphic here? We have the resampling function from MOR3. This will do five folds and the K fold cross validation. I re repeat this uh, quite a number of times. The textbook author noted that this next chunk of code would take about 15 seconds of runtime on a computer. And that actually ended up being true in my case. Um, suppression of warning messages. And in the workflow, bring up the task, bring up the learner, in this case, the generalized linear model. And we also define the resampling procedure up here. Save the results, say as AUROC results in that make in that metric. And depending on who you're working with, you might want to simplify those results as well. I want to thank the textbook authors for allowing people like me who are just trying this out to be able to skip stuff like this and load up the results in a separate data file. Conventional cross-validation was done in a similar experiment on the right, spatial cross-validation on the left. We might be dismayed at first to see that we're getting slightly lower AUROC values for the spatial cross-validation, even though we do want to acknowledge the spatial matters. But if you look on that horizontal axis, most of these values are between 0.7 and 0.9. So we are still getting relatively good values for AUROC. From there, we could look at support vector machines. The authors note that random forest might be more popular than support vector machines. However, um, some relatively recent work says, yeah, it is um, saying this in easier terminology. It might be easier to tune the parameters of support vector machines and get results pretty quickly. I copied these notes from the textbook, but when I brought in the learner function, for some reason, this KSVM code did not work. So I had to revert this back to just a classic support vector machine. We we're supposed to have this type of classification that also did not work. So I, I went back to an older code at the time. Sorry, I'm not sure why that all happened. So anyways, we um, continue building up through the workflow, do the resampling through the spatial cross-validation. All right, so, uh, next is to tune the hyperparameters. Maybe on this image, we'll start in the top right. When we're dealing with data sets in general, we have uh, different splits for our training and testing set along with our cross validation process. Uh, bottom right, uh, tuning on various testing sets. I oversimplified that, what I just said. 
on the left hand side, uh, once again, we want to acknowledge that dots or data that are close to each other spatially are probably related to each other. So we're a little more careful with the partitions, as you see in the yellow and purple dots. Um, when we're doing the performance estimation and the fine tuning of the cost validation of the algorithm, I should say. So then our workflow looks like this. We have our spatial resampling. We could ask for kind of a grid search. Um, in this universe, this is the tuning package from MOR3. They affectionately call this part of the process the terminator. And we'll otherwise do a random search through those through that grid search. And a little bit more about that grid search. Thus, um, for the workflow, we're using a support vector machine. We are at some point tell the process where to resample, how to measure, this is the AUROC measurement, the grid search. Um, apologies, I didn't actually describe the terminator process correctly. And then the fine tuning. If you're curious about the underlying mathematics, how there are like thousands and thousands of iterations, I copied and pasted that into this um, side note called accounting. <clears throat> now, the textbook authors quickly point out at this point, if you have high performance computing or at least a computer with multiple processors, you probably want to take advantage of that. You could use the future package to do deal with that. And this is a quick way to tell your R Studio session to use half your available cores because um, maybe you still want to leave the rest of your computer available to um, answer emails or watch Netflix. Because in particular, this next chunk of code quoted to textbook authors could take a half a day on a modern laptop. We run this through the pro progress R package with the support vector machines and a few other items in there. If you're working especially on a, a remotely on a high performance computing cluster, remember it'd be in the habit of actually shutting off your job when you're done. And then finally, the last two bits of code are similar as before, get the AUROC measurements and give yourself a nice table of results that you could look at when the whole process finished. I will once again admit, I decided not to um, have my computer try this out for half a day, loaded up the results instead. And they finish off the chapter by saying, after all that, the support vector machine to talk about the land side susceptibility at various locations, got an AUROC metric of about 0.74. Maybe good, maybe, maybe can be improved. That actually brings us to the end of chapter 12. I could talk about chapter 15 next, but I thought we would pause here. If you have any questions, feel free. Um, what do you want to discuss? I have a quick one, like, do you think like we have like a lowest uh, rock uh, uh, rock uh, value? Is it because like, uh, are we overfitting or is or the cross validation take that into account? Because like, even if we, st if, if we take like the, the basic like GLM model, it's at 0 0.8 something. Yes. And uh, is it like because like this GLM one was kind of like 
maybe like the all train that test train that I said is not enough like or is it just because like we are lowering the quality by splitting differently or result I don't know it's it's kind of surprising <laughs> and GLM is pretty fast <laughs> right so like you were saying with GLM um, it was probably a bit more flexible maybe using a slightly more complicated polynomial kernel yeah whereas yeah, it's the support vector machine, maybe maybe by default, they only have a, a linear hyperplane separation. If they tried out a support vector machine with maybe a radial kernel or something more flexible or complex, I should say, maybe they would get better values. Yeah, so it's kind of, maybe it's because like, yeah, the GLM is like maybe trying to go too close to the data, maybe, and maybe it's a bit of a fitting, let's say, let's hope. Mm -hmm. so i do not have any id uh, good job like debugging all of that but yeah also i'm not very that's familiar but i think like mlr using like you know is a good example of package that use like the very complex object so you need like the dollar sign to index all of them and calling them but you know like you have like in your code like uh yeah yeah for example like you are calling the object error SPSV that CLM and inside of it the score that's happened to be able to take a function. So it's quite complicated, I think. You have a node so. object that contain met. It's more like it's working more like Pythonic stuff with method. I feel, um, and for beginners, it's quite a, a, a big step. I don't know, like if you if you go like from just a classic error and then you go like to uh, as a tidy model tidy model is maybe easier i feel but i have less experience with it mlr is quite quite steep and even if you check at carrot before or ranger they were easy i mean easier <laughs> they were not easy but mlr yeah, feel... I, I agree like um carrot was okay but at the same time when learning uh, the tidy version people like me were just always hoping for something closer to the tidyverse. Yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, as I said, I think people in Europe tend to use more MLR uh, and MLR3, uh, mostly because it came from like, you know, academia. So people in academia tend to follow more academia because you have publication, et cetera, et cetera. So it's easier to publish than your work if you work on tidy model, which have uh, also publication so but i think this is this is one bias europe versus us for having living in the two places <laughs> that that makes sense um do you recall where the textbook authors come from one of them yeah Jakub is for if from poland janes is for germany and robin is for uk there you go so they are yeah um any other thoughts on chapter 12 while we're here no, good job, like explaining all of that. It's, it's super complex stuff and it took time and it's, yeah. It's... So as I mentioned to folks in the Slack channel, the last few chapters here, transportation, geomarketing, ecology, and definitely the conclusion are relatively short compared to the stuff we studied before. I'm going to skip to the ecology chapter because one, even though I'm a mathematics teacher, I tangentially work with biologists. So this is out of out of the three application chapters, I figured this was the most where I could offer the most expertise and just hit hit nudge nudge if anybody else wants to do transportation, geomarketing, that's all yours. Uh, there was a lot to say at the beginning. Like any um, journal paper, there was a huge abstract to describe what's going on. I'll just leave that there in case anybody's curious, but to get to the point. We're going to under, uh, analyze the composition and spatial distribution of vascular plants. Um, think flowers. On the southern slope of Mount Mongon, a lomos mountain near Casma in the central northern coast of Peru. What happens in this area is that uh, being away from the ocean and most of the rivers, this is actually a pretty dry area most of the time, arid. Of little moisture. 
except for uh, when the fog rolls in. The fog does bring in a, a, rel a relatively much, much, much more moisture. Every few years, there's this periodic behavior called La Nina, and that will definitely bring in a lot of moisture. Anyways, um, the study group was thinking about if they could um, use satellite data in that area you see there in the map and get a sense of kind of partitioning or describing different uh, regions in the biology and see if we could use machine learning to do so. Once again, copy and pasted uh, some of their work um, methods. Uh, data is from NOAA. So we're going to go after a random forest model. I just think that's kind of cute considering we're talk about plants anyways. Uh, some of the packages underlying some of these processes where it's data table to speed up some of the data load, loading and processing. Some of the packages we saw just back in ch chapter 12. I will admit, I, despite your presentation a couple weeks ago, I did not get QGIS process running on my computer. What computer are you using? Uh, Windows. Yeah, I, I, I'm, to be fair, I think it's very Linuxy oriented. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. And also adorable, um, people who work with ecology made a package called Vegan. Uh, like in chapter 12, the textbook authors have the data in their SP data large package. We're loading these data sets. The study area is a polygon shapefile. Random points, point shapefile. We have a community matrix of visited sites and observed species. So we have these various species of, of plants, um, 100 of them perhaps, or there, that is, and uh, various locations. So these numbers are proportions of the plants that are observed in, the, in that study location. And the textbook authors wanted to note that sometimes these numbers actually do exceed 100% if there is somehow some sort of overlap between observations. But otherwise, you could point we see that this matrix has a bunch of zeros in it, and especially if you're working with a much larger data set, you would want to work with a more sparse representation. We have a digital elevation model, which we are familiar with, usually expressed as a raster. And we have NDVI, which is also going to be expressed or stored as a raster. Just to quickly explain NDVI, just in case people are watching this video later, the Landsat satellites, um, when they take um, satellite imagery, they have at least eight bands. It might be more now. And what that means is when they get to satellite images, they have different measurements, three of them being red, blue, and green. Some of them being other types of measurements such as ultraviolet light and near infrared. There is a quick formula that you could do. Actually, there are many different formulas you could do, but one of the most popular ones, especially for when you're just starting out with GIS technology is this called normalized difference vegetation index. It takes a few of those satellite bands, applies a quick formula, and it highlights where you see green as, as far as green plants. And the goal is to get a sense of where there are more plants. So anyways, uh, what we have so far is the black dots are the study locations, 
the gray polygon is the study area. The colors in the background are the elevation of that mountainside. This is a southward facing slope. So it gets a lot of sun. The brownish colors are higher up on the mountains and the greenish colors are lower down the mountainside. We're gonna talk about the variables a bit just to make sure we understand what we have for modeling and predictive mapping. And we're gonna actually talk about this, in my opinion, was a bit more mathematical than I thought it would be, non-metric multidimensional scaling. Since uh, folks who have been working with GIS have done some of these computations for quite a while. Uh, they have this Saga wetness index algorithm that is available in QGIS. And thus, as you mentioned before, we could bring up a QGIS process using that package and do some work in that realm. This connected the information for, again, Saga wetness index. We're going to save that process as just call it EP for environmental predict predictors. We're going to ask QGIS to run the algorithm called Saga Wetness Index with the digital elevation model. The elevation model is talk about slopes, kind of in the first derivative calculus sense. producing a, for, a, a format that we're gonna like later, basically. We could extract the area and slope columns from that process and turn it back into a raster, raster using the terror package. In the rest of the literature, this was called catchment area and catchment slope. So we're gonna make sure that the names are the same. As we discussed in previous sections, you definitely want your geometry, your coordinates to line up. So make sure that the origin for the environmental prediction and the origin of the original digital elevation model match up. Finally, combine your rasters together, digital elevation model, the NDVI satellite data, and the environmental predictors we have multiple rasters, so sometimes this is called a raster brick. For catchment area, this was the water flow. These were non-negative numbers where some areas had very little water, some areas had a lot of water, especially if you're talking about a river. So once again, the authors did a log transformation. Now, I admit I did not actually run this QGIS code on my computer. Textbook authors foresaw that in advance. One more time, supplied the data file up to this point for us to practice on, and we could just keep going from there. At the moment, we have this data frame. Digital elevation model, NDVI values, catchment area, and catchment slope. As I mentioned before, the species plot matrix, um, literally asking if the species was found in each study area, mostly filled with zeros. And that tends to happen a lot with remote sensing, soil sciences, geomarketing, and other fields. So when you're working with big data, you probably do not want many vectors. And if you could do some dimension reduction, that would help out and speed up your calculations. There's a good resource mentioned by the textbook authors about this, I guess back in the day, this was called ordination. 
or you could also refer to the slightly newer or actually much newer information found in the vignette for the vegan package. Now elsewhere, say in computer science, cognitive science, a lot of biology, um, biology um, professors I hear from, they perform pr principal component analysis. You know, that's what we were all taught. It's very popular. Can you do it in uh, present substance matrices? Sorry, what? It's not present substance, but like, would it go well with this uh, high multidimensional matrices, the PCA? I'm I not thought, sure. Uh, uh, well, I thought it's the, uh, to have done some in my thesis, it was not great. I mean, <laughs> work it, but like, um, yeah, with a lot of zero inflated and um, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, and the authors noted also, we have nonlinear distribution of plants. They are, um, have these very steep or sharp spikes in their distribution uh, where the modes are. There are only certain areas of plants want to be. And also joint absence of a species. That is, if two plants decide that they both do not want to live in the desert, it does not mean that the two plants are similar to each other. They just both hate the desert. And so we got to worry about what we mean by similarity. So these are conditions. And as you mentioned, with the sparse matrices, um, or why we might not want to do principal component analysis and why the we're being asked to consider instead this tool dating back over 10 years called non-metric multidimensional scaling and MDS. Um, not necessarily have to read off all the mathematics. The final metric here is called stress and we're looking for numbers that are less than 10. NMDS is an iterative procedure. We could um, get the nice data format from the vegan package. Remember we have, uh, sorry, I think I misspoke about this earlier. We have a hundred sites and 69 oh. species. That's fine. Mm -hmm. You can invert them. Anyway. Yeah. So. One way to uh, clean this up really quickly, if the species was never found in the study area, don't worry about it. And we got this down to removing 16% of the rows. Hmm. We're gonna perform that NMDS algorithm, again, coming from the vegan package. Here's what the output looks like. So you could see some root mean squared errors. You could see some max residuals. Um, you want to tell the procedure to stop at some point. It's supposed to stop on its own, I think. But in my trial run here, they did 20 iterations and reached the exit of the loop at that point. The stress value can be extracted as an attribute. And to be honest, I have no idea how you get a stress value of nine out of that. But nevertheless, nine is a good result. So uh, this next bit, partly uh, for sake of time, if you've seen principal component analysis, uh, the idea is was to reduce dimensions. They kind of rotate couple of what we call principal axes to hopefully capture as much of the variance as possible. NMDS does something pretty similar. And from here on out, we're going to consider what's happening on the, on the main axis, the first dimension of this whole process. Got a convenient rotate function in the vegan package. And then we're going to compute the scores along that main along the first two axes, really. 
So it's very similar to a component an uh, composant analysis, a PCA. Yes, it is. Yeah. Here in this graph, the elevation along the hillside on the horizontal axis. So left is in the valley, right is the mountaintop. The vertical is the first NMDS axis. And we could see that if nothing else, we do have some sort of correlation and we are detecting some sort of trend. The whole point of this case study is to try to do some somewhat unsupervised learning to describe the different regions of plants along the hillside. So what we're getting is the floristic gradient, literally um, describing differences of where the flowers are growing. Once again, perhaps a pun with random forest somewhere along the way. Uh, there was a little bit of data wrangling to get the data frame format you want for your tree model. Coming from the tree package. And what we see is that the DEMs are the elevations. And you can see that the tree model splits literally by elevations. And the four leaves were separating the region, the hillside into four regions of plants. Yep, the pretty argument to make the text uh, um, quickly viewable or easier to view. Um, I should have mentioned this earlier, textbook authors mentioned it here. Uh, this machine learning task is numeric as, as compared to chapter 12, where we did a, did a binomial or categorical setting. So what we're doing right now is a regression task instead of a classification task. Because we're doing regression instead of a classification, we are not using A, U, R, or C. We'll use a different metric, root mean squared error. Uh, the textbook authors at this point, like the random forest models, uh, I kind of like them too. They're a little bit easier to describe to people and clients. And they tend to do well with uh, relatively little tuning of the hyperparameters. We're going to create the task going back to the MR um, universe, making sure to use the spatial cross validation. We're using the ranger learner because we're making tree models. We have the search space and we have our workflow learner resampling, the metric to measure things after the end, the terminator um, to describe when to stop the process if need be, the search space and the tuning. Nice, Ed. And then run all of that. Uh, we get this talk about the tree model. Remember, was random forest. The way it deals with the bias variance trade off is it actually does not use all the variables all at once, it does random subsets of them. And they find some of the best trees are still using about 90% of the variables. In, in this case, it's like a presence of spaces, presence and in, in some spaces in our case. But then finally, one more time um, in the R universe, when you get a nice model in place, fortunately, the good old ubiquitous predict function does what it says to do. The numbers might be ugly. Keep in mind the complexity is that. We are somewhere along the first axis of this NMDS process. So that's why we're getting some strange numbers. But what we're supposed to look at right now is that these numbers are relatively close to each other. And to be honest, these were even closer when I ran this um, on my own computer. 
when we use the predict function from the Terra package um, on the raster. Remember, the whole idea was to split the study area into different regions where you would find different plants. And we get our four stripes or bands in that sense. And just in case anybody was curious, there's a manual code to do these predictions as well. All right, folks, so that's the end of chapter 15. Good job doing two chapters. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult chapters. I don't know. Yeah, that was I, that was actually a lot of fun, you know, except for the stuff that didn't work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure about QGIS process. I think it's work way better in in Linux, but yeah. Or at least uh yeah, no, it's good. Uh, do we have someone for next week? That's one question. And the other question is, do you want me to ask if the author want to have like a QA and a session? Uh, uh, they mentioned it that they wanted to do it. So as, as you like, we can. So first, let's solve the first question for next week. Then we can solve the other question. I, I'd be happy to do um, the the last chapters, but I'm not available next Monday. It would have to be in two weeks. That could also like let, give us time, like to set up something with the author. Yeah, that, like, that'd be great. But to do that, okay. So we do that. Okay, so I ask them and I report to the chat, uh, to the to the Slack. Okay. And for the Q QA session, like usually John organize them like uh, a bit. I don't know if we need to organize them a bit. We are few, so it can be like just 15 minutes I'm saying, or, and we prepare some question and we can organize uh, this question in the Slack. What do you think about it? And okay. just to say, so they're in Europe, right? <laughs> yeah, they're in Europe. We will have to manage something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes uh, they both travel, like, I know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, we, can, we can manage it. Yeah, Tony, like, machine learning is, and st statistical learning is super specific. Like, it's, it took time, like, to get everything correct. But, yeah, I, yeah. And also like more, more I do, more I work like for the private sector, less I feel like you have good data enough to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah. All right, good okay. seeing you guys um, in two weeks then. Yeah, let's, let's see in two weeks. I will, I will ping John saying like not next week and uh, I will uh, report back from the hotels when we can meet. For 15 minutes, half an hour. It's mine. Bye, guys, and good job, Derek. It was great. Thank, Thank you. you. See you guys. Bye, Bye. guys. Thanks. Have a good night. <laughs>